Okay, afternoon. Good to see you all. Um, we, have, uh, we have 15 minutes, so I'll be fast, but I want to tell you what I think is happening and uh, to give you some idea of where we're going to go. And I'll start by saying that I think uh, the most incredible thing that's going to happen with AI over the next 10 years is we are going to rediscover what it means to be human. Um, and and I, this, this is one of the things that gives me the most hope and inspiration for what we are building towards right now. And I believe this for a lot of reasons, but mostly because of what we are doing. What we are actually accomplishing now tells us what we are going to accomplish. And for most of AI, for most of the scientific journey in this process, I, uh, in order to explain to you what was going on, I could simply show you a visual representation. Right? So I could just show you everything that AI could do in a very simple screen. The statistical machine learning models were very simple in this regard. But now we've progressed to a point where something incredible is happening. These models are far more capable than something I can visually represent. They are achieving incredible outcomes in things like mathematics. In fact, in June 2024, GPT 4.5 won the Math Olympiad, or 4.0 at the time. And so now, instead of showing visual representations of AI, what I simply say is this. We are building machines of human intellectual equivalence and superiority. This is what's happening. Agentic AI, robotic AI, physical AI, generative AI, these aren't, cool, these aren't terms that we necessarily use in the industry. What we instead talk about is if your brain can do something intellectually, we are trying to build machines that can do it too. That's actually what's happening. And as we do this, something remarkable is happening. Of all the trends that I care about, the rate at which these machines are getting better is staggering. So we broke Moore's law about 2022. The, the, the theory that machines would get twice as good and half as expensive every four years is now actually outdated. And instead, something incredible is happening, which is machines are getting twice as good every seven months. And now that machines are, have passed the complex reasoning threshold, we're now starting to see recursive learning where machines are helping themselves learn. And that presents an incredible opportunity, right? The logarithmic improvement of these models is going to do something incredible. But even more important than that is this which is that as these machines get exceptionally good, they are getting exceptionally inexpensive. And I remember very well, we released GPT-4 and everyone said, this is amazing, but it's way too expensive. It was $60 per million tokens. And CEO said to us, come back and talk to us when it's $10. That was their marker. Today, it's $1.40 per million tokens. The precipitous decline in cost of these models is incredible. And it sort of, to me, signals two things. One. We're on the verge of an incredible economic event because we know historically any time a critical resource declines in cost this much, let alone this quickly, there's a Cambrian economic explosion. Very good things happen when critical resources get inexpensive. This happened with water and then foodstuffs and then electricity and then the internet. Now it's happening with AI, except in those cases it took thousands of years or hundreds of years or at least dozens of years. In AI's case, it's taking four. The other thing that I care about, and, the, and I think as I've talked about in China, so I've been in China four times in the last 18 months, and one of the things that I keep stressing when I come to China is the fact that the research is probably a commodity, right? The research is actually not a differentiation. It's not a point of differentiation. It's not actually a thing that is going to, it, it's not actually a thing that's going to separate one company from another. What we have discovered is that as this research gets incredibly inexpensive, something really cool is happening, which is it's no longer the thing that separates. Given that, given that the research is a commodity, given that the research is in fact Do you want me to try a new mic? How about this? OK, that's better. Given that, given that the research is a commodity, given that the research is probably utility, then the question is, OK, where are we going? And where we're going, I think, is a pretty remarkable place. But I'll start with the simple stuff, because I think I can convince you of this.
All right. Uh, the integration phases of the AI revolution. So phase one is the phase we're in today. When we released GPT-3, when we released GPT-3 and then subsequently 3.5, I was the head of go-to-market and I was responsible for sales. And what happened was sort of disappointing. We could not figure out why more people weren't actually using the APIs. And so we went around the world and we were trying to show people how cool this technology was. And they were like, eh, whatever. And so we actually built ChatGBT not as a consumer app, but as a marketing, as an enterprise marketing tool. Our idea was we would show CEOs how cool the technology was and they would tell their CTOs they should use it. It's also one of the reasons that it was terribly poorly designed and, and, and under-resourced from a compute standpoint. But what we discovered in that process, and one of the things that I talk about now, is that the application itself is so critical. It's not enough to build great technology. You actually have to put it in people's hands in a very simple way. So the enhanced application phase, the one we live in, is the obvious and sort of inevitable first step in AI because it is the easiest way for all of us to actually adopt this technology. The second phase is the one we're headed towards, the autonomous agent phase. And the autonomous agent phase is the one that now everyone knows about and we're sort of talking about more and more. Agentic AI is a world in which agents will execute tasks and goals on our behalf across apps, across web browser, across data lake. And the autonomous agent phase is really exciting because whereas enhanced applications is making our lives 20 to 30 or 40% more productive, agentic AI promises to make our lives 100 to 200% more productive. But something really incredible happens during the agentic moment, which I actually don't think people fully appreciate yet. And yesterday, what's really incredible is OpenAI announced, for those of you who didn't notice, that Johnny Ives IO was going to be acquired by OpenAI and become a hardware business. And the reason that OpenAI has decided it needs to build hardware, pretty simply, is because it has discovered that the future of consumer technology is very different in a world where the internet goes from a place that we have to browse to a place that our agents browse. We design the internet as a library. We design the internet as a place that information is stored that we have to read with our eyes in order to use. And in fact, in doing so, we built a very inefficient internet. It is very slow. It's ornate. Right? It's actually a beautiful place to store information, but it doesn't really work It'd be like walking into a library and having all the information, all the books, sort of randomly placed such that they were looked really good, but it was very hard to read. That's what the internet actually looks like today, if you go just browse it. Agents, as they start to execute tasks and goals on our behalf, will help us redesign an internet to the most efficient place, which is, it turns out, probably trillions of TXT files. The future of the internet is almost certainly TXT and XML files, not designed for us to browse, but designed for our agents to browse. And when the internet is reduced to TXT and XML files, what we will discover is that the future is actually much more multimodal, even in our own capacity, that transmitting and receiving knowledge does not necessarily require our fingers and our eyes. It can now operate with our mouth, with our voice, with our brain. And then, in fact, much more happens passively, and that leads us to a natural language operating system, which is the simplest way I know to describe the world that I now know Johnny Ive is building for OpenAI and the world that Apple is trying to build and Google is trying to build and eventually sort of every hardware company will converge on, a world where we carry our devices to a world where we wear them, right? The physical hardware will change so fundamentally over the next 20 years, and we will go from carrying to wearing devices. We will also go from a world where we must learn how machines work to a world where machines know how we work. And that is such a critical, amazing shift in how technology is designed and we live with. And as a result, this is fundamentally what I believe. This is the biggest idea that I believe, which is the world will soon have access to unmetered intelligence. In a world where our technology gets very cheap and our technology gets very good and our technology fully integrates such that we don't have to spend a bunch of time learning how it works, something remarkable happens, which is the GPU, which is undoubtedly more powerful than the human brain, becomes so abundant that our own intellectual capacity, our own ability to process, 
pales in comparison. Actually, our brain will probably feel insignificant on any relative computational basis. And unmetered intelligence is actually a term that Boris Power, the head of research engineering, and I coined at OpenAI in 2021. And we did so because we were traveling around the world telling CEOs about how cool this technology was, and they didn't care. And so instead of trying to sell people on the apps, instead what we said is, imagine a world where they got a lot better. Right? Imagine a world where GPT-3 got a lot better, a lot faster, a lot cheaper. To the extent that your brain no longer felt particularly powerful. Now, that's not to say that there won't be important things inherent in the human experience, but it may not be your ability to compute. And unmetered intelligence, in my mind, actually presents us a very clear roadmap now for where AI will go and what we should build for. And what I think we all now need to recognize is that we have to start appreciating what unmetered intelligence will and will not change in our lives. The extent to which you have designed yourself as someone who knows more than everyone else, as someone who is smarter than everyone else, and on that basis you are successful, you will probably be very disappointed. The extent to which any company has designed itself around how smart it is, how computationally intensive it is, they will probably be disappointed. But there is plenty that does not change. I am um, expecting, I'm an expecting father. My, my wife is pregnant. <laughs> it's a very exciting moment, thanks. And what I realized, thanks so much. What I realized is I, um, I'm not gonna be a better dad because of unmetered intelligence. And it, uh, the, the, the world abundance of, of brilliance doesn't actually make me a better dad. There's nothing that can happen there. I need to show up and love my child. That's been true for, for, for millions of years in the human experience. No one ever said, I wish my dad was smarter. What people said is, I wish my dad spent more time with me. I wish my dad loved me more, or told me he loved me more. And this sort of leads me to, to the crux of what I believe, which is we have to start recognizing that, in fact, the human experience has some immutable qualities to them. And that so much of how we live will actually be redefined in a world where all of the things that happen day to day and most of the ways in which you have designed your life today will actually feel somewhat redundant in a world where machines can do these things far better. Education, therefore, will go from a place where we tell people what to know to a place where we inspire people on how to think. Mentorship, transmission of values become core tenets of early childhood education versus can you pass this test? Development, cultural understanding and public trust. We will go from a place of trying to optimize policies to actually a place where we try to bridge differences and gaps. So much of the reason I spend time in China is actually simply on a cultural basis to better understand what is happening in China and for Chinese to better understand what's happening in the United States. That cannot be solved by AI. You can see every photo you want of the United States. It doesn't actually change the fact that going there feels very different. Being in Macau, a place I have never been, is a remarkable thing. You can hear about it. Being here is of critical importance. And then last, leadership. Leadership goes from a place of knowing everything to actually a place of storytelling, narrative, human judgment, and vision. Inspiring people becomes so much less about how much smarter you are than everyone else than to actually how much you can inspire people. It's not about what you know, it's how you make people feel. There are so many things that AI will simplify, automate, digitize, and very clearly, this is not one of them. The last thing I will leave you with, young people ask me all the time, what should I study in college? And actually, in China, the most popular question I get asked from Tiger Moms is, what should my kids study in college? And what Tiger Moms are asking me is, how does my kid make a lot of money? How, do, how can I make sure that my child has a good economic outcome? And I have a terribly disappointing answer for these women, which is it doesn't matter what their kid studies in college. I am so sorry to say that it is no longer obvious that this major leads to a successful life. And so, instead of sending your kid off with a clear regimen, a clear discipline, study this thing and you will be successful, whether or not you actually enjoy it, such that they may find 10 years later they've studied something they hate, and by the way, it's now no longer economically viable, which is happening now all over the world. People are graduating realizing they studied something that they hate and it's not even getting them a job. Talk about a disillusioned class. If you're gonna go to college, what I tell young people is study something you love. Study something you are deeply fascinated by. The act of maniacally obsessing over information, not because it will get you a good grade, but because it teaches you how to understand something, is in and of itself far more interesting 
than the thing you are going to learn. I guarantee you. AI can make you an expert in most topics pretty quickly. Study the act of learning because that will teach you so much more going forward. And then last, optimizing for humanistic qualities. I said this before, I will say it again. It is more and more evident as we move through the world that so many of our jobs are reducing from what we know to how we make people feel. This is becoming very clear. And even now, what I realize is an expo like this, right, a conference like this works because we tried the COVID experiment. We tried to go virtual and it failed. We, try, we, we basically said, look, it's much more efficient if we all just stay in our living rooms. And everyone said, that sucks. That's not actually how we want to live this world. And so what we've now discovered in a world where we ran this virtualist experiment, where we went to the most economic, efficiently task possible, one of the things that has started to become very clear is the human experience has immutable qualities that we can't really clearly understand yet, but we know are true. And one of them is that the physical space matters more than anything. There is something about this moment, and I am reminded all the time, I don't get to stand on this stage because I know a lot about AI. It helps that I worked at OpenAI. It helps I have a lot of credibility. I actually travel around the world and talk about AI because I tell stories that people want to listen to. I could have been an email. I could have been a hologram. I could have been a chat GBT response, for sure. This could have been something that you could have queried at the right prompt at some point. It matters that I'm saying this. It matters that I'm saying this because something about our experience will continue to matter more. The last thing I will say is this. In a world where you can master or be great at anything, consider being great at things like creativity, curiosity, resilience, wisdom, courage, humor. As you wander this floor, you will discover so many vendors that want to automate and digitize a bunch of things in your life that doesn't actually serve these humanistic qualities. No one on this floor is proposing to make your friends laugh on your behalf. That's not actually how we're trying to design AI. No one on this floor is proposing to build something that makes you more courageous. No one on this floor is proposing to design something that makes you more curious, that sort of enhances how you view the world. What people are proposing to do is actually automate all the other things. And then this, I, I end this every time. People ask me, how can I change the world? How can I make the world a better place? I say, listen, one of the most important things we have to start doing is talking about the fact that the world is getting better all the time. Most people can intellectually believe that today is the best day ever to be born. And I can convince people of this very easy intellectually. But most people can't believe this emotionally. It is very hard, especially for parents, to say, I know the world is getting better, in large part because we tell ourselves very terrible, scary stories all the time. We are overexposed to negative information and underexposed to positive information. If you want to make a difference in this world, especially with AI, you have to start telling people stories about how the world is getting better. We have to start talking about the fact that we are reducing the cost of goods and services, that we are creating a more abundant world as a result of automation, that there will be societal change and a lot of weird stuff and also that we are very close to curing a bunch of immutable diseases, that we are very close to unlocking fusion energy and quantum computing, that there is actually a world on the horizon where things like exceptional education and healthcare feel more like commodities than luxuries, right? This is probably the ultimate promise of AI and we will get there by telling ourselves stories about how it's happening. We have a newsletter called the Next Renaissance Newsletter. I'll, I'll update you on the expansion of human potential. You're welcome to follow along at this QR code. Thank you so much.